Zoom. Okay. So for our timeline, again, this is just, you know, wishful thinking, right? <laughs> this is what, how I hope it plays out, but we don't know until we actually start getting in there and going through all the problems, right? Um, it may be that some sections go faster or slower as we go through them, but this is ideally what we want to do. Um, this section we have talked about once before, right? 2.6, that was when we would add the two functions together or multiply them or subtract them or divide them, right? And then we had to do some stuff with our domains back then, okay? Well, there was one more topic in the combinations of functions called composite functions that we never touched, okay? So it's like another thing that you can do with two functions other than just adding, subtracting, and multiplying and dividing them together, okay? So we're gonna hit that one topic from that one section. And then that's really all that we're gonna grab from that 2.6 section, okay? It's just this one extra little thing we're gonna do with the two functions. And then we're gonna go ahead and start 2.7. Now, the reason I need to talk about that composite function stuff is because that composite relationship is literally how they're going to define inverse functions, okay? So that's why it's super important to do that right before we talk about inverse functions. So we are gonna do that today. Hopefully I get to get through all of 2.7 after covering the new stuff, which is a 2.6 stuff, okay? I mean, all of it's new at this point, but hopefully we can get there. Once we cover these two sections, these two sections are gonna be quite a bit different than the rest of this unit, okay? The rest of this unit as an overview is going to be talking about two new kinds of functions. So in the past, we've always talked about like linear functions, then we got to quadratic functions, right? Then we extended that to all polynomials, right? And then we even extended that into rationals, which was the fractions of polynomials, okay? So we've covered really four kinds of functions so far. There's two other ones that are not the same as those, okay? And the two new kinds of functions are called exponential functions. Like I'm sure y'all have all heard the expression, this is growing exponentially, right? We're gonna hit that topic, okay? Then the inverse of an exponential is called a logarithm, okay? And so that's the other kind of function that we're gonna talk about. But we can't really talk about logarithms until we even know what the heck an inverse is, right? Which is why we have to do the chapter two stuff before we can get to the chapter five stuff. Okay, but that really is our goal is to at the end of this unit to really be able to work with exponential functions and logarithm functions. Okay, so they're new, but we're going to go for it in this section. I do have planned out a um, homework day in here. Um, hopefully everything works out the way it's supposed to. I am going to have to edit this because we did have to push this back, didn't we? Right, because we wanted to have, I wanted you guys to have that extra day to get homework. And it really did help a lot of you. So that's great, okay? I don't wanna eliminate the homework days if I can keep them, okay? What might end up happening, just to give you fair warning, if I cannot make up that day, like I plan to make up that day, um, by putting, covering two sections together instead of like cutting class early, right? Um, if I cannot make up that day that we're behind, all that might happen is we will have less days to cover the final review. However, I won't leave you hanging. However many, whatever we cannot cover from the final review in person, I will complete by myself recording and then post that recording for you guys to view, okay? So if that happens to happen, it's not like everything's lost, right? Okay, I'll still be able to go over that final review with you, okay? It may just not be live. Okay, so let's go, I'll fix that. I'll fix it today so that by the time we come in tomorrow, it'll have the corrected um, calendar here because we may, I mean, we can shoot for that, but I don't like to rush. So I'm never going to just try to like speed race through the, <laughs> through the content just for the sake of time. Um, I think it's important that you catch what's going on. Okay, so we're now in unit four, and then we're gonna start off with this section. So really we're learning about the composition, and then we're going to, I don't know that there's any word problems, but we'll see, okay? Normally the real world application stuff is for um, word problems. So here's the very beginning of it, okay? 
this composition stuff, it's going to serve you guys two purposes. One is that it's going to eventually allow us to introduce what an inverse is, right? I mentioned that. But the other thing that's going to help you is when you get to Cal 2, actually in Cal 1 and in Cal 2, in Cal 1, you learn something called a derivative. And in Cal 2, you learn something called an integral. And in both of those cases, you have to use something called U substitution. Now, you've kind of seen it with us when we do uh, problems that are quadratic-like, right? Um, we've seen some kind of U substitution there. But you really are going to have to get comfortable with being able to see like inside functions and outside functions is the easiest way I can explain it, OK? A function within another function, OK? And if you can start to recognize that situation, then you'll be better off in Cal 1 and Cal 2 when you see that happen, OK? And a composition functions is essentially that exact concept. Is It's identifying a function inside a function, or I'm telling you to plug a function inside of another function, OK? So they're saying here, um, another way of combining two functions is called the composition of one with the other. For instance, if you have one function, which is just x squared, and you have another function, which is x plus 1, the composition of f with g, and I even use the word with, I use the word of, OK? So f of g means that you plug g into the f function. And what is g? g is equivalent to x plus 1, right? It says up there, g is equal to x plus 1. So what you're doing is you're plugging x plus 1 into the f function. So I'm taking this one, and I'm plugging it into this function here, OK? And so notice what it looks like when you're done doing that. This x becomes this function, x plus 1. And so now it's not x squared anymore. It's x plus 1 that is squared now, right? OK? And if you can start to recognize later, eventually, and there are some problems in this section to get you to start that conditioning, if you can look at this and know that the inside function is x plus 1 and the outside function is just x being squared, this guy, then that's what that's the kind of skill that you need for Cal 1 and Cal 2, okay, is being able to distinguish what's going on in the inside and then what would the outside had to have looked like, right? That sort of thing. I like to use colors <laughs> to help me distinguish between the insides and outsides, so you'll see me switch my colors a lot. But if I were to write this function like this, In the colors, it's easier to identify what's the inside and what's the outside. So the inside is always the easier one to identify. And that one is obviously just x, x plus 1, right? The outside one is a little bit trickier to identify because essentially what you do is all the pink stuff just turns into one big fat x. So all this pink stuff just turns into an x, and then I have that square out there, OK? And so it's a little bit easier to pull the two functions apart when you have them kind of color coded like that, right? It's easier to see it. Now, this is where it gets a little confusing and I'm so sorry, but it just does. <laughs> is when I start talking about the domains and the ranges of these things, because you're taking a whole function and sticking it inside of another one, right? So what happens is, is that you have to go in order. In orders of operations, don't we always go from the inside out, right? So when you see an expression like this, I don't even want to talk about this notation just yet. But when you see an expression like this, you're basically, you have x values. These x values are in your domain, right? And when you plug them into this g function, you get outputs, right? So x's are your inputs, meaning they're your domain. And when you plug them into g, you get outputs for g right? That would be the range of G. But guess what? Because everything that's here has to get plugged into F, now you're talking about the range of G has to then get plugged into F, okay? And so then that creates a whole nother range, but it's not the range of F, it's the range of this composition, okay? So you have to be very, very careful. It, it gets really, really complicated. 
um, they try to draw it in this image here, <laughs> but really the range of G, those outputs for G is the exact same as the domain of F, okay? Because those outputs for G are exactly what's gonna go into the F function, okay? The reason why this is important is because they're going to ask us to do these compositions when I'm given two functions, when I'm given a list of points, or when I'm given a graph, okay? You're going to have to be able to find this composition in all three of those scenarios, okay? So this is the notation that they use. It's not a multiplication symbol, you, and it's almost like a degree symbol. You see what it looks like there, right? It looks like a degree, but it's not up high like an exponent, like a degree symbol usually is. It's just sitting there in the center like a multiplication, but it's not a multiplication, okay? So when you see that little open circle, you need to remember that that's a composition, okay? And the way you read this, when you see this, is you read it f of g, okay? Oops, can't see that. So that's how you read it, f of g. And what does that mean? That means you have the f function and you're gonna plug in the g function, okay? And it's exactly what it's saying there. Okay, so that's what it means, that's the notation. So if I ask you to do f of g, notice that the f is on the outside, right? And the G, which is a second guy, is on the inside. So if I ask you to do this, which function is supposed to go outside and which one's supposed to go inside? H on the outside and then of the F, right? And then of course you always have a little X. So just make sure that you pay attention to what order they're in. Because this, I say fog, because it kind of looks like the word fog, right? <laughs> But there's a difference between fog and golf, right? If I have this one, I'm not going to get the same answer as I do for that one, okay? If you do, it's very coincidental. One special situation that happens is if you do this and you do all the math and you end up with just an X all by itself, then you do this and you do all the math and you get just an X by itself again, then that's actually the definition of inverses. If you do this and this, and both of them turn out to be the same, and specifically both of them turn out to be X, that is literally the definition that tells us that these two guys are inverses because they both undo each other, don't they? Okay. Um, so we're gonna have some examples of that for sure when we get to it. We're gonna verify that they're inverses. That's how they're gonna word it. So let's see here, here they have a fog and then they have a golf and then they have an extra one that's a little bit different, right? So this one, they actually want you to plug in a number. These are easier to do than these, okay? But they started with a difficult one, so we're gonna go for it, okay? So this is the way we're gonna work. I'm gonna use my colors. So for the outside functions, I'm always gonna use my blue. And then for the inside functions, I'm always gonna use my pink, okay? To help us distinguish. So as I rewrite this, which one is supposed to go on the outside? The F. And so then on the inside is going to be that G of X. And so then now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna keep the F there, but instead of writing G of X in pink, I'm actually gonna write what G of X is equivalent to. And according to that sentence up there, what is G of X equal to? four minus x squared. So then these statements are equivalent because these things are equivalent, right? So this statement is equivalent to that statement because these guys are equivalent. Then the next thing I'm gonna do is start to plug in F. So remember what you're doing when you see this notation. This stuff in pink replaces every x you see in the function. It already replaced this X, didn't it? Because it's now pink, right? But now you've got to go in there and replace this X with that pink stuff, okay? So whenever you plug in things, always use parentheses. So this X is going to become four minus X squared, but then the rest of the X function is just plus two. So it's just that X value plus two. 
And then all I could do in this case is just combine like terms because I don't have a power out here to like foil this all out so many times. And I don't have a coefficient to like foil, uh, distribute in, right? So we can literally just combine our like terms. So four plus two is six. And I end up with six minus X squared. If you go, I don't know if you have the papers with you, but if you do, you might see at the bottom when they do it, they wrote it as negative X plus six. Is that the same, right? Negative X squared actually, plus six. They just wrote it in the right order. I left it like that. We have a sign, we'll take both. Okay, let's try the next one. Now who's gonna go on the outside? G. And so then on the inside is going to be the F. And just like before, I'm gonna keep everything the same and just plug in what F is. F is equivalent to what? X plus two. So then now when I come over here to write the G function, I am going to replace this X with this pink quantity, okay? When I do that, always put it in parentheses, right? So the G function is four minus something squared. Notice that instead of the X, what did I write instead? I just wrote open parentheses, right? With nothing inside. Now I'm gonna actually fill inside what's supposed to go in there. What is supposed to go in those parentheses? X plus two. And so then this one does have some stuff I've got to manipulate, right? I've got to bring in that square first because exponents come before multiplying by the negative, but then eventually I do have to multiply by that negative. So let's go ahead and do the math from here because I've already done all of the plugging in. So I am going to figure out what this is first. So when I FOIL this, remember it's X plus two times another X plus two. So I get X squared, two X and two X, is four X and then two times two is four. So I foiled it and combined the like terms and all of that in one step. But next I've got to distribute that negative. So that becomes negative X squared, negative four X and negative four. And then if I combine my like terms, I end up with negative X squared and negative four X. So I think with the colors, it helps a lot, especially at the beginning when you're trying to see it, right? Eventually I don't use the colors, but for right now it's kind of helping us to, to see what's happening here. Okay, this last one's a little bit different. So who's on the outside here? Whoever's in the front, right? So this guy goes first, I have to write him first. And then instead of saying of, I'm gonna use the parentheses to say the word of, and then F is what's gonna go inside. But notice that this time it's not F of X, right? It's not F of X anymore, it's F of negative two. Yeah. So it's a little bit different, right? It's not an X this time. Well, then what does F of negative two mean? That doesn't mean that I can just write down X plus two. It means I'm supposed to be plugging negative two into F, aren't I? Okay, so I'm gonna keep that G stuff there because I'm not doing anything here. But in order for me to do this, I have to plug negative two into this function. So I'm gonna say negative two plus two. And what do we get there? What is negative two plus two? Zero zero. So then now what does this tell me when I see G of zero? It's not zero. What is it saying I need to do though? Right, we need to plug that zero into the G function now. So now here's the G function. I've got again the zero in there like that. Okay. And then when I do that computation, I just end up with four, right? So that one's a little bit different than the other one. 
here's another way to do it. I did it like this because this is the way we were doing these, right? And I just wanted to be consistent and show you that you can do it that way. But when there's numbers, there's actually a cooler way to do it. Or to me, it seems easier, but you make up your own decision. <laughs> but another way to do it is to work from, work from the right to the left. So basically you plug in two into F. If I, negative two. If I plug negative two into F, what do I get? I get zero, right? Then that zero has to get plugged into G, okay? But that's another way that I've seen people write it, okay? And both of these would be considered showing your work. This one obviously has a lot more steps, but if you're using arrows to tell me what you're doing, that suffices, okay? So if you're saying I'm plugging negative two into F and I got zero, and now I'm taking the zero and I'm plugging it into G, and that's where I'm getting my four from, okay? That is enough explanation for me. You don't have to put all these steps. With this one though, you do have to at least show me this step. You might not need to do all of the different notations to get me there, but I do need to see you actually plugging in the G function into the F function, okay? And then go ahead and simplify it after that. Okay, so the next few pages is just those answers. So I'm gonna go through here. See, they got the same thing as I did. They just wrote negative X squared plus six instead of the way I wrote it, which was like that, right? It's the same thing. On the next page, they did this one. They got the same thing as we did, negative X squared minus four X. And then they're just saying note that they're not the same thing, right? We did F of, we did fog and golf. And for fog, we got this. And for golf, we got that. And are they the, are those two things the same? They weren't, right? Not in this case. Most times they're not. It's a very special situation when they do, are, when they are the same, okay? So it matters if you do them in the wrong order then, doesn't it? Because if I tell you to do fog and you give me this as the answer, that's not fog. That one was golf, right? So make sure you pay special attention to who's supposed to be on the outside. First guy on the outside. This one's inside the middle, isn't it? So that one should have been inside, okay? Okay, now this one, they plugged in the number. See, they did it like totally different than I did. I don't even wanna, I don't even know what they did. Oh, they took the G of F function since you already figured it out, right? You already did G of F, didn't you? They just took that and plugged in negative two. And so that's why it looks like this. Since they already found Goff with any general X, now you're just plugging in a specific X, right? I did it different just because you're gonna be given some problems where you're not asked to find G of F first. You're just asked to find G of F of negative two and that's it, okay? So let's see here. This is the one where I told you <laughs> you need to learn how to do, okay? So. It says you formed the composition of two functions when we told you to, right? We said, find fog, find golf, right? And we gave you the two pulled apart functions to start with. Now they're gonna start making you think backwards. In calculus, you're also gonna wanna be able to pull those two separate functions out from something that's already compiled together, okay? Or composed together. So for instance, this function here, you should be able to look at that and recognize what's on the inside and what's on the outside, okay? That's the idea here. It's very obvious when there's parentheses or when there's a square root of what's on the quote unquote inside, right? Because if you've got parentheses, there's something inside those parentheses, right? It's obvious. And if you have a square root, there's obviously something inside that square root, right? So those insides and outsides are pretty obvious to see. Um, it does get a little bit more complicated sometimes, but I don't know that we get into that complexity in this class, okay? But for here, it's obvious that 3x minus 5 is inside those parentheses, right? So then for me, that inside function would be 3x minus 5. Now imagine removing the three X minus five. Then you've got a big blank and then a cube, don't you? So that's the outside function. That big blank turns into a giant X and then the cube is there, 
So the outside function becomes x cubed, okay? And that's all they're saying here. The inside function is the 3x minus 5. And then if you remove that and replace it with the big giant x, the outside function would be just x cubed, okay? Okay, and so that's the way they've got it there. So basically h becomes f on the outside and g on the inside. Okay, um, now let's say this process is called decomposing, right? Because if they're already composed together <laughs> and you're pulling them apart, you're decomposing it, right? Okay. So, dun, dun, dun. oh, I was like, where's example one? But that was all the problems we just did. So here it says the number in of bacteria in a refrigerated food is given by n of t, and then it has this function here, and it tells you the limits of t. t is between 2 and 14, where t is the temperature of the food in degrees Celsius. When the food is removed from the refrigeration, the temperature of the food is by this function, where t, little t, is between 0 and 3. It says where little t is the time in hours, I guess that after it's been removed from um, the refrigerator. It says find the composition in of t of little t and interprets its meaning context, okay? So what's gonna happen? If this is telling me the temperature with respect to time and I plug that temperature into here, what is this one telling me? This one's telling me the number of bacteria at that certain temperature, right? And so when I'm plugging this into there, that's going to tell me how many bacteria I have after so many hours of coming out of that refrigerator, right? I haven't done the algebra part, but I can answer the context part. What will that tell me? It will tell me the number of bacteria after T hours. Okay, that's the context of what will happen. If I'm taking something that has T with respect to time, I know what the temperature is after a certain number of hours. And once I know the temperature, I know how much bacteria there are, right? So essentially, you know how much bacteria there are based on the time. Now let's go see algebraically what that's going to look like. So they already did it for me down here. So if they want me to find N of capital T, that means that the N is on the outside and the capital T of little t is on the inside, just like they have right here, right? So what does that mean? That means I actually like to write it a step in between here. That means I need to plug in capital T and capital T is 4T plus two, okay? So I'm going to plug in 4t plus 2 into the capital N function. So here's the capital N function. And all of these capital T's are become 4t plus 2. So 20 of 4t plus 2 squared minus 80 times 4t plus 2 and then plus the 500. And then from there, you're just doing your algebra, right? So I definitely got to square this. So I have 4t plus 2 times another 4t plus 2. And when you FOIL that out and you combine your like terms, you end up with these three. If I distribute this negative 80, I end up with these two guys. If I distribute that 20, I finally get these terms. And then from here, they just combined all of their like terms together and got this, okay? And so it's saying the exact same thing that we said, but in a full complete sentence, right? <laughs> it's saying that that is gonna basically tell me the number of bacteria that happens after a certain amount of time. So you're basically just cutting out the middleman, okay? You're finding out the number of bacteria after so many hours, okay? Now, let's go see what else they have for us. We're not in this section just yet, so I wanna see how far Oh, there was a part two, apparently. Yeah, there was part two. It says, find the time when the bacteria count reaches 2,000. 
So you do have this function here, right? You have n of t of t, and you know that it's equal to this, right? And it wants to know how much time happens when the bacteria count, which is this number here, the bacteria count reaches 2000. So they basically replace that in with 2000, and then you have the rest of that function there. And so you solve for it. You'd have the minus 420 first, right? So you'd get 320t squared equal to whatever that is. What is 2000? minus 420, what is going on? 20, there we go. And then I would have to divide by 320. And so I'd get T squared equals 4.9375. And then I would have to take the square root and I'd get end up with 2.22204, blah, 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 right? Does it make sense to have negative 2.2 hours? No. So you get this or this, but this one doesn't make sense for time, right? There's no negative time. We can't go back in time. And I guess you can just take it back in the refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> It'll go back to its regular bacteria. I don't know. Do the bacteria die if you stick it back in the fridge? I don't think so. They just move slow, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Reminds me of my daughter's science class. She's like learned that fry, flies move slower in cold weather and they move faster in, in hot weather. And I was like, I did not know that. That is so weird. I never paid attention. Okay practice. There's some for us. Try these. Try them. Do one at a time though. Okay. Try f of g first. Let's just work on that one first. So try f of g and then let me know what you get. I'm going to turn off my camera just so I can do it. Um, make sure you write down your functions though because you're going to have to do three different problems for these two functions. So F is X plus six and G is X minus nine. And try them. I'm gonna turn off the camera and then you can try them. We'll see if we get them. That way you can practice. Did anybody get anything for F of G? Anybody get anything for just the first one? F of G? Don't be afraid to get them wrong. Now's the time to get things wrong. <laughs> it's on the test, you don't want to get them wrong, right?
Did anybody get that for the first one? Did you get that? X minus three. So F goes on the outside, right? G goes on the inside. And the G function is X minus nine. So what I like to do is I like to write the F function, but I just use parentheses for all the X's. So notice that F is X plus six. So I just wrote a parenthesis plus six. And then I plugged in that X minus nine. Okay. And there was no power on the X minus nine, no number in front that I had to distribute. So it's just X minus nine. And then I brought the plus six. And then we can combine our like terms and then we got the negative three. Try the next one, the G of F. It becomes the G function. The X and the F function becomes the G function. So instead of X in parentheses, it's now G in that parentheses. And so whatever the G function is, that is what replaces your X value. And that's super important that you understand that it replaces the X. Because I do get some people that start, they leave that X that was in F, they leave it there, and then they put in the X plus minus nine next to it. And it's like, no, 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 you're supposed to take that guy out and replace it with the X minus nine, okay? So notice that here, there is not this guy right there. This guy X plus six, this guy is gone. It becomes this whole X minus nine, okay? It's super important that you see that. So very, very, very good question. Any questions that always ad address common errors, I need you to ask questions because my brain's been doing it the right way so long that I forget what are the possible wrong ways that people will do it, right? I can only, if I remember <laughs> from the previous semester, then I'll be able to mention some of the stuff that happens. Okay, so we're do it here. We have G on the outside, F, and always put an X in the inside. Even if you don't, I don't mind. It doesn't bother me if you just do this. It doesn't bother me if you do that, okay? There's nothing wrong with that. They don't have an X up here, so whatever, right? But what is F? X plus six. And so when I go to do this step, this is where I lose people, right? When I go to do this step, this is my advice take the G function and write it out. But instead of X's, do open parentheses. So notice that I wrote the G function, but instead of the X, I just wrote an open parentheses. That is the best way I can explain how to do that step. And then you just take whatever was in this parentheses and put it in all of those parentheses. Because sometimes there will be more than just one, okay? Then I have no exponent, no coefficient to be messing with. So it's literally just X plus six. And coincidentally, it turns out to the exact X minus three, right? This is coincidental because we did another one that did golf and fog and they were not the same, right? So you do not ever know when they're gonna be the same when they're not, okay? So always make sure you're doing the correct one. Now the last one, do I even need F at all? No, I'm gonna use G twice, right? This one's gonna be real weird. <laughs> so G on the outside and G on the inside. So I'm gonna keep this one on the outside like I have been. And what's gonna go on the inside then instead of G? X minus nine. But I've got G on the outside. So I'm gonna write out that same function, but using my parentheses method. And then what's gonna go inside that parentheses? Mm -hmm. That was what was in parentheses before, right? So it just goes in parentheses again. And then now you have X minus nine minus nine. So you get X minus 18, which is different from the original F. I mean, the original G, isn't it? So when you did G and G, it changed the function, okay? 
Okay, so that's all of those, just to kind of give you some practice with that whole plugging them into each other thing, right? Now this one says for number two, oh gosh, they want me to do all the domain stuff. But this one's not hard, because what's the domain of F? If it doesn't have a fraction or a radical, what's the domain? All real numbers. So then what's the domain of G? All real numbers, right? So we already know this one. It's just negative infinity to infinity. We already know this one, negative infinity to infinity. And if I want to know the domain of F of G, this one's harder. It's harder because I have to think, but it's not so bad. Because the domains are both negative infinity to infinity, it's not as complicated, okay? But let's take a look at this F of G. I'm basically going to take the X's and plug them into G first. So all these negative infinity to infinities are gonna get plugged into G. What is gonna pop out of that G? Because whatever pops out that G function is that range is going to be my domain for this. Okay, so remember that little thing on the other page. I'll bring it back up. I wrote it down, but it's coming into play now. The domain of, it should be actually here, the domain of f of g is equal to the range of g. Okay, so it's super important that you know what the range of g is so that you can know this guy's domain. Okay, because all of that stuff from g is going to get plugged into f. And that's literally what the domain means. It means what's gonna get plugged in? What can get plugged in, okay? So what the heck is the range of G? As I plug in positive values, when I square them, don't I get just bigger positive values, right? When I square zero, I just get zero, right? So that's great. But what happens when I square negatives? They all turn positive, don't they? So none of my outputs will be negative, none of them. So my range of G is actually gonna be zero to infinity because when I plug in zero, I do get zero, right? But if I plug in any other little decimal number or any other giant number, it is gonna give me all the other numbers from zero to infinity, okay? Because if that's the range, that's also the domain of f of g. Now they switched it on me over here. So who's the inside function for this one? f is the inside function there, right? So since f is the inside function, I need to know the range of f, okay? So let's go at it. If I take f, all the domain of f is negative infinity to infinity. So I'm plugging in anything into this f function. No matter what I plug in, aren't I going to still get a number out? It's just going to get shifted a little bit by four, isn't it? Right? But it doesn't matter because if I plug super, super, super low numbers, one, I still get a super, super low negative number. And if I plug in a super high positive number, I'm still going to get a super high positive number, right? And everything in between. So this one actually has a range of negative infinity to infinity, which means that's actually going to be the domain of G of F, okay? They are not the same, are they? So be very, very careful. Those are very hard to think about. I don't know that you have to do that a lot. There may be like one problem in the homework where you have to do it. It's just not something that we talk about a whole lot. Mostly it's this that you're going to see a whole bunch in the future, okay? I still haven't done parts A and B though. That's the mechanical part. So for F of G, that means I need to do F on the outside and G on the inside. And G in this case is X squared. So, so I wanna plug X squared into F. So I'm gonna write F with the big parentheses plus four. And what goes inside that parentheses? whatever was in this parentheses, right? Doesn't that go in there? And there's really nothing to apply here. So it's just X squared plus four and I cannot do anything with that. So that's it. Now we'll do part B where it says G of F. So G is in the front, F is on the inside. 
So I'm gonna go always work from the inside out, okay? Orders of operations, right? When there's parentheses, you have to go from the inside out. So we have to mess with this. Oh, what did I do? Didn't I mess up? <laughs> there's supposed to be a G in the front, right? Not an F. Yes, thank you. So then F goes on the inside. And so instead of the letter F, I'm gonna use its expression. And then instead of G, I'm gonna use parentheses. And then this X plus four goes in those parentheses and distribute and combine like terms. And you end up with this. How do I do that fast? I visualize it. I know that that's X plus four times X plus four, right? And then all I do is I know that the front guy is gonna be X squared, the back guy is gonna be 16, and then that's 4X, this is 4X, so that makes 8X, right? It's literally what I'm doing in my mind, okay? I'm literally just imagine it and then do it. So you can do that. If you can do that, go for it. If you have to foil it all out, foil it all out. There's nothing wrong with that. It just takes you a little couple extra seconds, right? Okay. Here's the good one. This one's the one that, if you learn something in here, learn this, right? Because this is going to help you in a calculus. So we want to know what is the inside function and what is the outside function. It is very obvious what the inside function is. What do you see inside that radical? Mm -hmm. And so then the outside function is going to be F because they have F on the outside and G on the inside. And if I take that X squared minus seven out of the picture, don't I just have the cube root like that and there's nothing inside anymore? Right? But what do I have to put in there if I'm writing a function? Mm -hmm. An X. And that's it. That's the outside function and that's the inside function. So all your blanks just become X's. It's the reverse, right? Didn't I write it with blanks and then plugged in the stuff? Now we have the blank and we got to put the X back in there. Okay. So I think that took us, what, an hour? 45 minutes. So 45 minutes to cover this section. There's not a whole bunch you're going to be doing in this section. I don't even know that you have word problems in your homework. Um, but if you do, you have an example. And if that example is not enough, what can you do? You can text me, right? And ask me how to do your problem, whatever it is you're working on, OK? So don't forget, I am a resource. Probably the best resource, because I know what's coming on the test, right? <laughs> so make sure you utilize your resources. OK, so now we can finally talk about inverses. Now that we know some stuff about conditions, we can eventually talk about um, verifying whether two functions are inverses of each other, OK? Now, before they go there, they're going to just kind of try to get you to realize what um, inverses are, OK? We actually kind of already have been using them this entire time. Every time you solve an equation, haven't I been telling you, like, if it says plus 4, you minus 4, right? If it says x squared, you apply the square root, right? All those functions that you've been applying to these equations, um, you've always been implying the inverse of something because you want to get rid of it, OK? That's exactly what inverses do, is they undo each other, right? So if you have x plus 4 equal to 0, what are you going to do? You're going to subtract 4 on both sides, right? The inverse of addition is subtraction. If I have 3x equal to 6, you're dividing by 3. Why? Because division is the inverse of multiplication, OK? And again, this one. You go and you put this guy in the picture, right? Why? Because squares and square roots are inverses of each other. OK, it gets more complicated when there's more than just one thing happening. 
like for instance, this. And this happens, okay? There's more than one thing happening here. Don't, aren't you multiplying, squaring, and subtracting, right? And so when you write the inverse, what order am I supposed to put the plus, the divide, and the square root in, right? Like I wouldn't know, okay? There's a process to find it and we will talk about it eventually when we get to this set. It's easy when it's just one thing. It's harder when there's multiple things happening. Okay. So it says, we know that a set of ordered pairs can represent a function. For instance, the function X plus four can be formed from the set one, two, three for A and to the set five, six, seven, eight. So one, if you add four to it, gets mapped to five. Two, if I input that in here, I get six. Three, if I input that in here, I get seven. Four, if I input that in here, that's eight is my output, right? So set A is my inputs, set B is my outputs. And you can put those in ordered pairs. So the one got mapped to five, the two got mapped to six, three got mapped to seven, the four got mapped to eight, right? Now, if you swap these coordinates, you just completely swap them and you write five comma one, six comma two, seven comma three, and eight comma four. That swapping that you just did is what is called the inverse, okay? You just completely switched it on me. Your domain became your range and your range became your domain now, okay? So when that happens, that's what an inverse is. It's when those values just completely swap over. And so now look at the relationship. How would I go from five to one? I'd have to minus four instead of adding four, right? And then six, how would I go from six and my output being a two? I would have had to have minus four. Same thing for all of these. And so this is the inverse function for that regular function, x plus four. And that's exactly what I told you, right? Didn't I tell you plus and minus were inverses of each other, right? Okay. Now, so this is important because they are going to ask you about domains and you need to know that the domain of F is equal to the range of G and the domain of G is equal to the range of F. Why am I mentioning this? Because they are going to ask you for all four pieces. Okay. However, we know how to find domains. It's a lot harder to think about ranges. We had to think about it just earlier, right? And it took us quite a while <laughs> to think about it. So this is harder to do than to find domains. So great, if I know that these are equivalent, then all I need to do is find domains and then I automatically have the partner ranges, okay? So that's super important for later. So here we go. It says, if you do the compositions with one another for those two functions, remember we had f of x equal to this guy, and then they showed us that the inverse, if we swapped them, the relationship became x minus four. So if I do these compositions, if I plug this inverse into there, I get x minus four, all of that replaces this x, and then I write the plus four. And if I combine these like terms, I end up with just the x. Now, if I go the other way around, I take the f function and I plug it into there. So instead of x, we're going to be writing x plus 4. And then after that, I'm going to write the minus 4. And when I combine these two symbols, I end up with just x again. Now, this was that special relationship for inverses only. If you plug them in, you do one composition, and you just get x. And then you do the other composition, and you also just get x then you can say that they're inverses of each other. Now I do get people, I myself will do things halfway if I can get away with it, right? Do not do one composition, get X and say, oh, they're inverses. Cause it can happen and it has happened where when you do the other one, you don't get X, okay? And so then that means they're not inverses. It has to be X on both parts to be an inverse, okay? So you cannot, just do half of it and then not worry about the other one. Now, if you do half of it and you don't get X, you don't need to bother with it because who cares? It's not X, right? So just be careful when you're verifying those guys. Let's see, what does this say? 
It says find the inverse of four times X, then verify that both this composition and that composition are equal. Okay. And this is exactly the same thing, right? I kind of mentioned it already. It says the function F multiplies each input by four. To undo this function, you need to divide each input by four. Isn't that true, right? Isn't that how I would solve an equation? If it's multiplying, wouldn't I divide, right? So that's all they're saying. So the new function should actually be those inputs divided by four, okay? The other one was adding four. And so then the inverse was subtracting four, right? Here, this one's multiplying by four. So the inverse will divide by four. Now, what happens when we do those compositions? So what happens, let me write the functions again, just cause I like to see them before I start trying to do all this. Now, I didn't even address it. Look at the notation for the inverse. It looks like it has an exponent of negative one, doesn't it? But that is not an exponent, okay? And I mention that because I'll get a lot of people that remember that when you have this, when this is a variable and you have this, that means one over X. And so then when they have a function with this symbol, they try to say that it's this, and that is completely inaccurate, okay? I know it's confusing because it looks just like an exponent, but when it's attached to a function and not a variable, there's a difference, okay? So here, the negative one is applied to an, is applied to a variable. And so it does follow those exponent rules. But this looks like a negative one exponent, but it's applied to a function, which means it means an inverse, not a fraction, okay? So I wanna point that out because I don't want anybody trying to use that exponent rule on inverses, okay? It's not the same thing. So this is saying F and this is saying F inverse. So the inside function here is the inverse function. So that means I'm going to be using the X over four. Then that X over four is going to replace X in the F function. So it's gonna be four times the X over four which is this. These guys will cancel and I do just get X. I did get X, so then I will continue with the second half. If I did not get X, then I don't need to continue. It's already bad, right? Now let's go the other way. Let's put the inverse on the outside and the regular F on the inside. So the regular F was four X. And when you're doing this expression, you're basically replacing the X's in the inverse with the four X. So this guy right here will become that four X. And so that's why you have four X over four. Those fours cancel again, and you do still get just X. And so that is the process of verifying that they're inverses with one another. And I think on the computer, what it does is it, um, it does this, it has F of G or it might have F of F inverse and then it has the blank and then it has the opposite one and it has a blank. And so you need to do the composition so you know what to plug in there and then plug in there, okay? And then at the end, it'll ask you, are they inverses or not? If these are both not X, then the answer is no. Okay, but if these are both X, then you can say, yes, they are inverses, okay? So here's the formal, formal definition. It says, if this composition equals X and this composition equals X, then F and G are inverses of each other. And then G of X would actually be written like this instead. So instead of calling it Gary, going to call it the inverse of rank, right? Okay. That's all it's saying. If you have that relationship, then you can say it's an inverse. Now, this is exactly what I was talking about. 
says don't use a negative one to denote a negative exponent. It's actually um, referred to an inverse, not the reciprocal of f, meaning don't put f of x underneath the fraction. Okay. Now, there is something special that happens graphically with inverses. It's really cool, kind of. When you graph inverses, interesting enough is they reflect each other over the line y equals x. So for instance, on this function, they graphed f, which is this guy, and then they graph f inverse, which is this guy. And both of those graphs look like a mirror image of themselves if the line y equal to x was the mirror. Okay. And so it's true, right? Doesn't this one go out, in, and then out again? And then this one does the same thing, but in the opposite direction, doesn't it? And so they do look alike. For instance, oh, I don't need to do it. I was going to show you that it did the same for x over 4 and 4x, and it did the same for x plus 4 and x minus 4. But they have one here they want me to show you. So why do it three times when I just do it once, right? Okay, so here it's telling you that these guys are inverses. Notice that because it's minusing, I'm gonna have to add, and because it's multiplying by two, I'm gonna have to divide by two at some point, right? So these guys, um, but notice that it's not this versus this, right? So the order in which you add the three and you divide by the two matters. Okay, so do not try to guess what inverses are. Please do not do that. There is a process to follow. We haven't gotten to it yet, but there is a process. Do the process, do not try to guess inverses because chances are you're not gonna put the operations in the correct order, okay? You're gonna just put minus three and divide by two and you're not gonna put them in this, the right order they're supposed to be done in, okay? So let's do what they want us to do. We're going to graph these guys. Um, if I distribute that one half, don't I get one half x plus three halves? Right? So I'm going to use my old school steps to solve equations or to graph equations. This is my m and this is my b, which is my y intercept. This is my m and this is my y intercept. So I'm going to go one, two, three. That's my y-intercept. And then from there, I'm going to go up to and over 1. I'm trying to make this as nice of a graph as possible because I want it to somewhat look symmetrical. Oh, they're going to graph it for me on the next page. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I'm trying to make it look pretty, but they're going to make it look pretty for me. Here. Let's talk about how they did it, though, OK? So here, here's the negative three I just graphed, right? Then I just plot just this one point. From that one point, you wanna go up one, two and over one and go up one, two and over one. Once I have a few dots, then I can connect it and draw the line, okay? Now for the other function, the two X minus three, no, that's the one I graphed. The other one was one half X plus three halves. Three halves is actually 1.5, is it not? Right? So my Y intercept should be one and a half. So I'm gonna go up one and then a half, and there's a point there. And then from there, I've gotta go up one whole unit and over two whole units. So I'm gonna go one whole unit, which is gonna put me at another half, and then go over one, two. And I actually landed here in the middle. And I could do it again if I wanted to, but you only need really two dots to draw the line. So you can just draw the line once you have those two spots, okay? Now I'm gonna draw y equals x. Now y equals x means that all the coordinates are gonna be the same. So zero, zero, one, one, two, two, so on and so forth, right? Because the y value should equal the x value, right? So here's zero, zero, here's one, one, Here's two, two, so on and so forth. And that's enough for me to draw this line here. And do the two graphs mirror each other over that line y equals x? They do, right? This half mirrors over to this half. 
And then this bottom half mirrors over to this bottom half. Okay. So they are in fact inverses of each other because they do reflect over that line. If you graph them and they do not reflect over that line, then they are not inverses of, of each other. Something. Start coughing all crazy. <laughs> Don't drink anything. Okay. Um, was there another part to that problem? It just said, sketch the graphs on the same coordinate system and show that they are reflections of each other. Oh, we did that. Oh, they want us to pay attention to those points. If you notice some of those coordinates on there, these are the coordinates for f of x. And if you look at the coordinates for the, this function, you'll notice that these are the coordinates for the other function. And what relationship do they have? They're swapped over, right? Wasn't that exactly how we used to find it at the very, very, very beginning, right? An inverse is literally just the swapping of those very of those coordinates. Okay. So two things that are happening here before I can talk about that swapping situation. One is that that reflective property um, is called or the reflective property of the graphs of inverse gives you a nice geometric test. <coughs> Excuse me, like a graphing, a visual of how to determine whether two functions are functions or not. However, some functions are not easy to graph, right? They take a long time. So sometimes you're not going to want to do, you're not going to want to graph two things just to see if they look like mirrors of each other, okay? There is another way though, if you do have the graph of one function, you can, you can not only find the inverse of the other function, like what the inverse is gonna look like, but sometimes functions don't even have an inverse. And we haven't even addressed that. I haven't even mentioned that to you yet, have I? There are functions that do not have an inverse, okay? There's just one does not exist. There's no, nothing that you could do that is gonna undo whatever someone did to this X, okay? Um, there's just functions that are like that. They're, they're, they have no inverse. Those kinds of functions are what we call not one-on-one -one functions, okay? So you can be a function. This guy is a function. That's X squared, right? X squared is a function. However, it is not one-to-one. -one. When I plug in this x value and I plug in that x value, don't I get the same y value, right? That means it's not one-to-one. -one. And why is that? When I go to try to apply the inverse function of a square root, don't you get plus or minus? You get two answers, right? When you try to undo that thing. That's why it's not one-to-one because -one, you get two responses. Okay, that means x squared is not going to have an inverse. Okay, it's just not. Now, I can make it have an inverse. All I have to do is chop this off and tell you x squared where x is greater than or equal to zero. Because now I'm talking only talking about half the, the graph and is half the graph one-to-one? -one? It's only the positive side, right? So when I take the square root, I'm only gonna get the positive answers, only one answer, right? And so now it is one-to-one, -one, okay? So you'll notice that when you see x squared in your homework, it always has this comment on the side. And it has that comment because it's forcing this function to be a one-to-one -one function. That way you can find the inverse, okay? But functions that are not one do not have inverses. And there's a quick way to tell if you're given an image. It's called the horizontal line test. If I look at that x squared function again before I scribbled half of it away, you'll notice if I draw one horizontal line right there in the middle, it touches it two times, doesn't it? That means that that guy is not one-to-one. -one. Now look at x cubed. It looks like that, something like that, right? Is that one one-to-one? -one? Right, no matter how many horizontal lines I, I draw, none of them touch it more than one time, right? 
So the X cubed is one to one, okay? And so that is literally the horizontal line test. So they will be giving you a couple of graphs. I think there's one on the final. So that's a super nice problem to have on the final. Just look at it. If it you draw a bunch of horizontal lines and they touch twice, it's not one to one, okay? Um, dun, dun, dun. If no horizontal line intersects the graph at more than one point, then no Y value is matched more than once. That is essentially what we call one-to-one -one functions, okay? You must be a one-to-one -one function to even talk about a inverse, okay? And so this is just literally talking about the X squared function. Um, however, they're doing this stuff, but X squared is not a one-to-one, -one, so I don't understand their point in doing this. Oh, they're saying that when you swap these, these things for um, X, there's no single function that you can use to describe how you go from two to negative two and one to negative one and zero to zero and one to one. Like for these guys, I could use square root of X. But for these two, if I do square root of X, I don't get negatives, do I? Okay, so that's what they're saying here is that notice that for x squared, you can't find just one function to describe an inverse. That's why that guy doesn't have an inverse, unless you do away with all these negative values. If you do away with the negative x's, then you won't have those people in your table, and then you don't have that situation happening, right? And you do have an inverse. Okay, so here's the graph. It says the graph of this function is given because no horizontal line intersects the graph more than one point. You can conclude that the function is one to one. Okay. Now look at this one. Is that one one to one? No. It, it even has a line right there for you. It's bad. It's not one to one. Those are super easy. So, yay, four points on the final, right? <laughs> that one is super nice. Okay, here's the good stuff. Once you can verify that it's one to one, then you can go ahead and find its inverse. Okay. And here's the process of finding the inverse. This is super important. Okay. So it says use the horizontal line test to decide whether or not it has a function, it has an inverse. Once you figure that out, you're going to take. Um, I honestly don't ever do step one. <laughs> just to be honest, I just go through step two. And if I have to do a square root with a plus or minus, I already know, nope, I don't have a function. I can't have two inverses. I can only have one inverse, right? So if I ever have to take a square root and I, I have to, by algebra processes, I have to put the plus or minus in there when I do the square root. So if I'm drawing the square root on both sides of this equation, I have to put the plus or minus in. And as soon as I do that, I'm like, nope, that's two answers. This is not an inverse, okay? So I don't ever <laughs> do step one, to be honest. But here's the first thing. This is fancy notation, this f of x business, right? It's all new, we just learned that, okay? Go back to your regular notation for these, okay? People get confused with f of x and f times x. So just get it out of there so you don't have that confusion, okay? So instead of writing f of x, you're just going to write y. Now, I had this problem here. I already know the answer. It was minus 3, I think. And then they told me that this was the inverse. Right? It was something like this, OK? And they told me that that was the inverse. But now I'm going to follow this process and see if I get that, OK? So the first step for me is this one, and that's to replace this weird notation with just the Y. And that way I don't have letters in there confusing me, right? It's just a Y. Then once you do that, you're gonna interchange the X's and the Y's. What that means is that all Y's, it should only be one, the Y is gonna become an X, and all X's are gonna become a Y. So this becomes two Y minus three. And then from there, you're going to solve for y. So how do I get y all by itself? Don't I have to add three first, right? 
So I get x plus 3 equals 2y. And then what do I have to do next? I have to divide. Yep. And another way to write this is 1 half times x plus 3. Right? Instead of writing over 2, you can write 1 half. Okay. Then the next step is to replace the y with f inverse. Now, I'm going to do two things at one time, though. Not only am I going to turn this into f inverse, but I'm also going to swap the sides of the equation, right? Essentially, I'm, I'm going to write it this one time, but eventually I'm not. Essentially, I'm just rewriting the equation like this. Isn't that the same exact statement? It's just like looking at your balance beam from this side of the room and then looking at the balance beam from your side of the room, right? It's still balanced, it's still equal, right? Now that's when you're gonna change this to this notation. And normally I don't write this. I just put the Y on this, so this notation and then I take all that mess and I stick it over there, okay? Instead of having to write it out twice. Um, and it says to verify, but I usually don't do the verification either, just because as long as I know all my steps are good here, I'm pretty sure it's going to undo itself. Okay. And I did match whatever they said it was supposed to be before. Okay. That's the process of finding an inverse. So don't guess on what is the inverse. Make sure you actually find it algebraically. So here's the function. I don't have any squares in here, so I'm pretty sure the thing is going to be a one-to-one, -one, okay? Any even powers, you're, you should question those, okay? But this one doesn't have any even powers, squares, fourth powers, six powers, none of that. So I'm going to go straight into the process. I'm going to replace the fancy notation with just a y. I'm going to interchange the x's and y's. So this y becomes an x, and all, both of these x's become y's. What the heck happened here? Oh, they have an error. This should not be there, should it? That's some kind of typo in the computer. Nothing should have been done. That's a complete typo. That's what it should look like, right? If all I'm doing is replacing the y, the f of x with y, shouldn't the right-hand side look exactly the same, right? So I don't know what they were doing, <laughs> who typed that in there, but it wasn't me. I just copied and pasted, but <laughs> that is not right. I'm going to have to make a note of that to the publisher so I can fix these slides. Um, okay, then we're going to interchange. So this Y is going to become an X, and I only have one X value that's going to become a Y. All of a sudden, it's correct again. That's weird. Okay, from there, we've got to solve for Y. So this step is wrong again. I think what they did is they changed the problem and then didn't change the solution. So what do I need to multiply each side by to get rid of this fraction? Just two, not three y plus two, okay? Just two. So I'm gonna multiply this side by two and I'm gonna multiply this side by two. And what happens is I get two x equal to five minus three y, okay? What would be the next step to try to solve for y? Minus five. I want to go see how wrong they are over here. Oh yeah, you're way off. Nope, that's all wrong. So yes, I'm gonna minus five, minus five, and I end up with two x minus five equal to negative three y. What would be my next step? Mm -hmm. By what though? Negative three. And I'm telling you now, they do not like you to leave it as a fraction. So you actually have to write negative one third times two X minus five. And I have my Y by itself. They just do not like those fractions, okay? I would have just put a one third, but because the three at the bottom is negative, I put a negative one third, okay? And then we do the swapping thing. So I'm gonna rewrite this in the other order but I'm also gonna turn that into the F inverse notation. So F inverse instead of Y equals this. Okay, and that's the inverse of this function. Dun, dun, dun. They did change it because this is not the graph. Look at this function. 
and then look at your function. I think somebody was gonna do this problem and then they decided to change it to that problem, but all those steps are still the same as the original before they changed it. So I definitely need to tell those publisher people that problem's bad. Okay, here's some practice problems. It says, determine whether um, the function has an inverse, provide an explanation about how you determined. If it does, then find the inverse function. So does this one have any squares? It doesn't, right? And squares are usually going to be those ones that fail the horizontal line test. If I graph that, I know I have a vertical asymptote at negative four fifths, so somewhere over here. I know these are the same degree, so I'm gonna have a horizontal asymptote at one and a fifth, something like this. And if I plug in zero, I get 1.25. I don't know what's bigger, 1.25 or 6 over 5. 6 over 5 is 1.2, 5 over 4. So it's above. So I'm going to be right there. So then we know what happens here. That's 1 to 1. And then over here, if I plug in, let's say, a negative 3. 6 times negative 3 plus 5. 5 times negative 3 plus 4, negative 11. So it's down here somewhere. So I know what that one's doing too now, right? It's doing something like that. I'm sure it doesn't look like that exactly right. Probably looks a lot nicer <laughs> on your actual graph paper. Before, just an example, you do have one of these kinds of curves that goes like this and one of these kinds of curves that goes like that, right? Does that pass the horizontal line test? Does it? It does, right? And so you would just say it is one to one by the horizontal line test. Then it says if it is one to one, go ahead and um, find the inverse. So remember, fancy notation turns to y. And this one we have not seen before. It is very complicated. But you guys are the engineer people, so they give you all the complicated problems. Aren't you happy? You're going to get challenged for the rest of your lives if you're an engineer, just FYI. Be prepared. <laughs> that is your job, is to be challenged every single time. Okay. Now, <sighs> interchange. So the Y is going to become an X. The X's are all going to become Y's. This one is way more complicated. I'm going to keep following my normal natural steps, OK? We're just going to have to see what surfaces as we go, OK? So normally, when you have a fraction, what do you do? Mm -hmm, by where the denominator is, right? So I'm going to multiply this side by 5Y plus 4. And I'm going to multiply this side by 5y plus 4. Now, normally when it's two terms, we put it in parentheses, right? So on the right-hand side, these are going to cancel. And I'm not going to have a fraction anymore. Yay, because I do not like fractions. But on the left-hand side, um, I need to distribute this x. So I have 5xy plus 4x. Now here's where it starts getting interesting. Who are we supposed to be solving for? For y, that was the directions, right? Change f to y, switch the x and y's, and then solve for y. So when you normally solve for x, don't you get all the terms with x to one side and then all the terms that don't have x to the other side, right? And then the only thing you have to do left is divide right? It's that same sort of process. So I want all the y terms on one side and the stuff that don't have y, I want those on the other side, okay? And just because you know me and I like y on the left, that's what I'm going to go with, okay? So I'm going to leave this y value here. I'm going to take this guy and move it back over there. 
but I also want this y value over here with him, right? So I'm gonna minus the six y on both sides as well. And so what happens is I end up with five x y minus six y. This guy's gone, this guy's gone, and I have five minus four x. Is that okay so far? Now I cannot combine. Normally I would combine the, the x's together, right? And then just divide. But here I cannot combine because this has five x and this just has six, right? And six and five x are not like terms. So I can't combine them. But what I can do is factor out that common variable. If I factor out that common variable, then what's left inside no longer has a y, right? Because it got factored out. And then I can do just like I did with the x and divide by this thing, whatever it is. Okay, so I'm going to divide by 5x minus 6 on both sides so that this goes away and I end up with just y all by itself. But on the other side, I have this. And this is not one of those that I can rewrite as a fraction because there's an x in the bottom, right? It's not like the one half or the one third where it was just a number at the bottom. This one actually has an x at the bottom. So last step is just to use the little notation they like us to use. And we are done there. Practice this one. There's some in your um, homework, but I think that this is one of the ones that's on the test. I, I, it's been a while, but I do think that this is one of the ones. I know there's some problems that ask you to find the inverse. And it might be like two of them, but I think this hard one is one of them. Now I can't possibly, we just don't have enough time, right? To find the inverse of all the different kinds of functions, right? So try when you see all those different functions in your homework, try them. And if it's saying it's wrong, just text me and ask me, why is this wrong? And I can try to figure out where it went wrong. Okay. Um, number two. Number two, you also have some like these in the homework. It says determine whether the function has an inverse. So is it one to one? Is this one one to one? Do y'all know just without me even explaining it? Can you tell whether that's one to one? It is not one to one. The fast way to tell is if any of the X's repeat or if any of the Y's repeat. They can't repeat, right? That's literally not a one-to-one -one if they repeat. When we were talking about whether something was a function or not, we said that the X's couldn't repeat. And so here, of course, none of the X's repeat. But now that we're talking about, that was the vertical line test, right? To tell whether or not something was a function, we used the vertical line test because we were looking at X values repeating. Now for inverses, for one-to-ones, we're looking at the y values repeating. And so we're using the horizontal line test. And I have y values that repeat right here. And I have y values that repeat right there, right? So this guy is not one-to-one. -one. And it says provide an explanation. And we'll say four maps to seven and eight maps to seven. That's all I need is just one example, and it's not one-to-one. -one. If it does, then find the inverse, but it, it wasn't, so we don't have to find the inverse there, right? Okay, I think we're kind of like pretty much out of time. We have like 15 minutes left, but I really think that's enough <laughs> to absorb for a day. Um, let me go just the last few minutes and see if there's anything in the homework that stands out like I have not talked about at all. I try to avoid that from happening, but every now and then there might be something. And I might not have time to talk about it right now, but at least we could talk about it at the beginning of next class period. Ah, yes, we have not talked about these this why is this in here this should not be in here i'm gonna have to go in there and look at that because 
I mean, you can do it, but it shouldn't be in there. What is F minus G? If you see F minus G of one, isn't that F of one minus G of one, right? So what that means is this is the X value and they wanna know the Y value. But what function are you supposed to be looking at? The F, right? So if I go over here, let me zoom this in because it's real, real tiny and I'm blind. This is the F function. So when X is one, the Y value for F is actually two, right? And then over here, if I wanna do this one, put my minus sign. If I wanna do G of one, I need to look where X is one, but I need to be looking at the G function. What is that Y value? <coughs> three. And when I do that math, what do you end up with? Negative one, right? Two minus three is negative one. Now here they're multiplying them together. So when you plug one into F, you get two. And when you plug one into G, you get three. But what do you get when you multiply two and three? You get six. So those are the old ones. Those are not the new things, but it was in here. It's not impossible to do, so I'm just gonna leave it. Now this one's harder. Remember the process. I showed you the shortcut, right? You plug two into G first. So that means two is the X value. And what's my output? It happens to also be two, right? So that becomes the input for F. So over here, I'm gonna look for two and then find the Y value. What's the Y value? The point's right here, isn't it? So what's that Y value? Zero. Now let's go do it the other way around. So now two goes into F first. So two is the X value and I'm gonna go look for the F's Y value. So two is the X value and what's the F's Y value here? Zero. Zero becomes the X value for G. So I'm looking over here. This zero X value gives me what kind of output? Four. Notice they're not the same, right? completely different because you're looking at two different graphs at two different times, okay? So be very, very careful with that one. I hadn't done one with the graph. These you should be able to do. Those are good. Okay, now this is too big that it's making me dizzy when I spin. Okay. Yep, yep, yep. It's just a matter of different looking functions, but it's all the same stuff. Um, bum, 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 bum. These are the good ones. I need you to practice these guys. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. And that's it. There's pretty much all of it. Very good. Now let's go check out 2.7. If you forget what I just did there, please rewatch that part of the video because <laughs> it goes fast, right? When you're looking at that graph. So just rewatch it. And if you need to keep asking, keep asking me questions. I'll always, if I recorded it, I'll always take a look at the recording. But if you're like, miss, I looked at it, I'm still confused. <laughs> then I can, help it, I can help you further, right? Um, dum, 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 nothing, nothing, same thing. Oh, the domain of F is the range of the other guy. And the domain of this guy is the range of that guy. Y equals X. Okay, those are a bunch of just rules. They're in the paper. Um, does this function have an inverse? Is it one to one? Do any of the X's repeat? Do any of the Y's repeat? So then it's good. I'm going to say yes. Does this one have an inverse? Does it pass the horizontal line test? It does pass the horizontal line test. Does this one pass the horizontal line test? Nope. Does this one have an inverse? No, you've got a repeated nine there and a repeated six, right? So this one's a no. These I'll let you practice. These I'll let you practice. So they do want you to identify which one's on the inside. So I'm gonna type in that one because that one's easier. F goes on the inside. So I should be typing this on the inside, okay? Then in the next step, you can actually plug it in and compute, okay? Combine any like terms if you can. Um, 
This one gives you the graph and they want you to graph the inverse. Literally take this spot and switch the coordinates. So this is zero, two, zero for X, two for Y. If I swap it, it's two for X and zero for Y, which is right there, okay? And that would reflect over the line Y equals X. So, and then it's supposed to go this way. If I'm reflecting, aren't I gonna go that way, right? So it needs to have that kind of graph. It might be this one, right? Doesn't it do that correct motion? This one has the correct spot, but it's not going in the correct motion. And that one does not have the correct spot. This one does, but it's not curving the right direction. It's supposed to go outward because this one goes outward. I'm imagining the line here and this is moving away from the line and then back to it, right? So when you're here, you need to move away from the line and then back to it. Same thing here, except you have two sides. So imagine the line going here. I'm supposed to go over the line and then out. Imagine the line down here. I'm supposed to go under the line and then out. So it's probably this one. No, not that one, this one. I would draw it on paper and then just see which one matches. So look, I have this. If I imagine that line y equals x, I'm gonna draw over and that way, and then I'm gonna draw under and that way. And this is what should be selected. Whatever graph looks like that. Is that the one I selected? It's the only one that even kind of looks like mine, right? This one's going in the wrong directions. These two are totally not it, okay? Um, dum, dum, dum. yes, do that one. These are all just the normal stuff we've been doing. They're just letting you say, oh, look, notice. Only pick the ones that look like images of each other. So this one, this one, definitely not it. These two might be, but I don't know which one's which. So I guess it depends on what your functions are. Um, blah, blah, blah. That one, I don't know. Let's do that one real quick, just because I don't know whether or not it has um, an inverse, so number 19. And I want you to be able to see what it looks like when it doesn't, when you try to do it and it doesn't. It's not one-to-one, -one, but how are you going to know that unless you graph it, right? I know what that looks like as a graph, but you don't yet, right? So if I try to do this, watch what happens. I'm going to go through those process just like before, swap those letters, and then start solving for Y. So I'm going to first have to get rid of that um, denominator there. And then I'm trying to get y alone. So the first thing I need to do is get rid of this x. So I'm going to divide by this x. And then here's where that part happens. I'm going to have to put a square root, right? When I do, I have to put the plus or minus. Can I have two inverses? No. So this automatically means no inverse. OK, so I would try find it. But as soon as I have to do that square root and you get the plus or minus, it no, it, it does not have an inverse. So even if you can't tell by looking at it, you can tell once you start trying. Okay. So I would suggest you actually start trying to find the inverse first. And then if you have that issue, you can click no. If you don't have an issue solving, then just, it's, yeah, it does. And here it is, right? You'll already have that part done. Okay. Um, ah, this one's interesting. Let's look at that one, number 22. Okay, it doesn't have f of x, but it's still p of x, right? So it's still, this is gonna turn into a y. And then can I interchange it? There's nothing, I mean, I can swap this to an x, but are there any x's that are gonna swap to a y? No. Okay, and so you just end up with this. There's nothing wrong. This is not two functions, right? It's just one function. 
So that is my inverse. So yes, it does have an inverse and that's what it is, okay? Actually, it does not. Is this a function? I boxed it and I shouldn't have boxed it. Is x equal to eight a function? It's a line, we've been drawing them as dotted lines when we would graph those, those uh, fraction functions, right? We would draw them at dotted lines, but it's not. Why is it not? If I draw, here's negative eight, a line, a vertical line at negative eight, does that pass the vertical line test? There's an infinite number of values on this one line there. And if there's even just more than one, it's not a function, okay? So this thing, although I got just one answer, this is not a quote unquote function. So then how in the world can it be an inverse function, right? It can't. So this y equals to eight has no inverse. It has a function that, or it has a graph that would mirror it along the x, y equals x. So here's negative eight for y. It looks like that, right? This is a mirror of each other over that y equals x line. It's just that that's not technically a function, okay? And that's why there's no inverse. So graphically, it looks like there would be one. It's just that what it is is not actually an inverse. Okay, let's see. It's the same with that. I could reflect that over. All it means is that this side goes like that, and then that goes like this, as funny as it looks. But is this a function? It fails the vertical line test, right? It's not a function, which is why x squared didn't have a function, okay? The same reasoning is just funky. We hadn't seen one like that with just the numbers and no variables over there. Okay, and then that's it. This was that hard one. Please practice it. You have an example, but try that one, right? That was the one where you had to move all the y's over and then factor and then divide. Okay, we are good. We are done. Does anybody have any questions? Um, just FYI, I think most of you did the ISLO assignment from before. Um, they did give us an extension because there wasn't a lot of people from all the classes um, doing the ISLO assignment. So if you did it, I had already added your points. I don't even remember what test it was on, but I had added those points. If you haven't done the ISLO assignment, you have until next day to do it, okay? And I'll add those points. It'll be less. I think I added nine for the other folks. It'll only be seven because you didn't do it the first time, right? Um, so if you do those, you can get seven points for the test form, okay? FYI, every bonus point that you get, I actually shift them at the end of the semester wherever it suits you better. <laughs> so just keep that in mind. You might see your numbers look completely different at the end. Bye. Have a good one. You too.